Hello, my name is Woody. This is Change in the House of Pods, a podcast about Deftones. Today, my guests are Phil Sangiacomo and Justin Shirell of Somnuri. That's Desire Lines from Sam Nuri's latest, Nefarious Wave, released just under a year ago when we spoke. It's kind of crazy to think it's been that long when my podcast had to suddenly go on hiatus after I got a new job. Uh, but about the only thing that's dated from this conversation is the fact that Sam Nuri got a new bass player. Bit of that going around. Uh, but th- this was a super cool conversation. Once again, because I'm a bit obsessed with the topic, we spent some time talking about the life of a song, its journey on and off a record, how it changes as it's played live, and they have some really insightful things to say about how they navigate that as musicians, and some really fun things to share about how they got into Deftones. See, Phil is the drummer in Somnuri, but he learned guitar listening to Steph Carpenter. And Justin sings and plays guitar in Somnuri, but you're going to hear him talk about learning drums and trying to master Abe's beats. These dudes kick ass. They're thoughtful and insightful and genuine Deftones fans. But before we get going here, a few things have transpired over the past week or so that have given me, well, they just made me feel good, and I want to share them with you. First, a week ago, I met a new Deftones fan, a young person named Frankie, a 16-year-old who's going to see them for the first time here in Minneapolis in a couple weeks. He discovered Deftones early in the pandemic, and I got to talk to him a little bit. I should tell you, too, he was fully into the new metal style. Like, he was wearing the baggiest Jinkos. He asked me if I had any giant brand T-shirts back in the day, which, of course, I did. But he looked just like we did back then. Uh, that, that was fully his style. And he told me about discovering Deftones and his favorite songs. He said Pink Maggot is his favorite, and he was looking for a live version on YouTube. I was like, man. You got to talk to my friend Vesnik. Uh, It was an incredible experience, though, meeting somebody brand new to the band, somebody so young, but also clearly so passionate about them. And then there was the couple who got engaged on stage in Indianapolis this week. How cool was that? A same-sex couple getting engaged on stage at a Deftones show. I found myself getting a little choked up watching the video. The proposal was just so good. But the fact that that happened on stage at a Deftones show, that was awesome. That resonated with me. I saw that video and I thought about my conversation with Head from Corn about new metal and how that moniker and the worst things about it got pinned to the popular bands of that time. And seeing that engagement happen on stage in Indianapolis, it felt like a reassurance that good people who love Deftones are hearing Deftones. Deftones are not defined by the quote unquote height of their popularity. They're timeless. They connect with everyone. And then finally, a few days ago, I got a message from my new friend, Tim. Uh, He hit me up on Instagram. I want to read you what he wrote. He says, hey, Woody, longtime listener, first time DMer. First off, big thanks for the podcast. I've enjoyed a great many car rides over the last year listening to you shoot the shit about Deftones. It's been super cool to learn about them from other musicians and people they've worked with throughout the years. I agree. Thank you, Tim. Uh, He said, you said, hit me up with your Deftones stories on the podcast. So after seeing them last night in Cincinnati, I figured it was finally time to drop you a line. In 2001, I graduated high school and started at Miami University in the fall. At the time, I was listening to mostly alternative and new metal, but for whatever reason, I don't think I'd ever gotten into Deftones. On move-in day, the two guys moving in across the hall were blaring seven words and jumping around their room like they were in a mosh pit. Part of me was like, these dudes are friggin' nuts. And the other part of me was like, damn, that shit rocks. I need to check that band out. Fast forward a year, and Zach and Brian from across the hall are now two of my best friends, and Deftones are my favorite band. In May 2003, Zach drove us four hours to Cleveland to catch Deftones at a club called The Odeon. We got there early and ran up to the front of the stage when they opened the doors where uh, we were center stage, second from the rail. When the band came out and busted in in my own summer, Chino immediately hopped down from the stage and up onto the rail. I reached up and he grabbed my hand to keep himself balanced while he wailed, and we wailed right back at him. At one point, Zach and our other friends looked over at me and realized that that was my hand he was hanging on to, and we were all just like, holy shit, this is awesome. 
Now, fast forward to late 2020, after Ohms came out, Zach and I were emailing, and I mentioned that I wanted to find a time to listen to the whole Deftones catalog chronologically. Hadn't gotten around to it, but once vaccines came out in early 21, we decided to book a cool Airbnb where we could meet up and hang out for a weekend, along with one other college buddy, and we declared Sunday Deftones Day. We shot pool all day and listened to the entire Deftones catalog top to bottom. It was awesome and reminded me how many great damn songs they have. There was no moshing this time, uh, but pool cues do make for damn fine air guitars, and we rocked the shit out of them. I said, thanks for reading. If you made it this far, thanks again for the podcast. Rock on, Tim. Tim, thank you. You got to ride the rail with Chino. You are a goddamn king, and I appreciate your message. All right, let's get into it. My conversation with Phil and Justin from Somnuri starts with a clarification question. Nefarious or nefarious? I say nefarious, nefarious wave. I, I say nefarious wave as well. Uh, I do like different accents uh, on syllables. So <laughs> nefarious or nefarious, Nefer- if you like. Nefarious. <laughs> yeah. So you know. uh, the, uh, the title track really... It feels like that too. Tell me a little bit about the song and, and the album. I think I was I was playing around with the the song name for, for for the title track, and it just felt it matched the song. And after we were kind of you know throwing ideas around, it felt like it really felt like the entire record had that vibe to it. Even though that song is maybe the outlier from the entire record, you know, it's it's more of a, a slow burner. Um, but yeah, to to me, it just kind of man, it represented the entirety of the record um, personally, and I think it was a a good representation, and, and you know, kind of a, a placeholder for a while, and then we didn't come up with any better names. So, <laughs> <laughs> if it felt like the last song on the record for sure, uh, there was really no order that made more sense than having that last, and then I think that just probably you know it encompassed the whole thing and and made sense for a, for a title for the record. Do you, I'm always fascinated by, by titles and, and like, especially ones that don't necessarily like, you don't hear the, the words in the song all the time. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think that's, and that's a very Deftonesian thing too, to have like placeholder song titles and then come up with these wild ass song titles that don't have like the words aren't anywhere in the lyrics or anything like that. Where did that song, how did that song title, was it just like driven by the music? Like, wow, this shit feels like a nefarious slow rush. Yeah. Yeah. I'd I'd say it it really was that feeling. And a lot of times if if I'm coming up with lyrics or how a vocal pattern will go, I try and find different, different words or just different phrases that match and kind of, you know, again, are, are a placeholder. And, and that those two words that nefarious wave just kind of kept standing out <clears throat> and it just felt right and didn't feel like uh, searching any, any farther for a, a something different, but it, it felt good. It felt right. And, you know, it stuck really well. That's cool. That's cool. I, I, I love the, the idea of having visual titles, uh, visual things to match, you know, music. Um, it seems it seems sort of consistent. Like when I look at the whole album, tied to stone, tooth and nail, like desire lines is maybe a little bit more like obscure or abstract, I guess. But, um, and then the artwork itself for the album, it's like, it's really just so visually engaging. And are you guys like visual artists in any way, or do you have some sort of uh, aptitude in that, in that, in that way, I guess? (laughs) Phil is now. Try, try to be. I did our logo. I, I try to do some of the graphic design and, and video work for the band as much as I can accomplish on my own. But as far as like, you know, setting out to make a piece of art, I think we try to leave that to to, to real artists that thrive in that arena. Um, and and uh, Danny Atrakshi, who did the art, um, she had done another cover and it was it was cool. It just you know, for whatever reason, we we knew we needed something that spoke to the music more, and and uh, and she nailed the second round, um, knocked it out of the park, and it was, and it did have more of this, you know, um, wave on in the art implemented in the art, and it was, uh, it started to take form, and I think even the name Nefarious Wave has start started to develop a meaning, at least for 
for us individually. And uh, I'm sure as the listener and, and uh, you know, when you pick up that album cover and you see Nefarious Wave and you see the art, I think it all makes sense now, uh, at least for us. Is that was uh, was there any input that you guys had in in um, in creating that that art or was it just sort of like letting her run with it? Yeah, I think like picking, you know, she would do a, a draft, um, draw something up and have like different elements in there. And um, and maybe we would say, you know, this thing doesn't quite fit there, but then these other four things do. So um, but then like she's so good about once she here's more of a vision that the band has and, and more of a theme. She just nailed it. So, uh, and then she came back with what, what's there now and, and, and the color scheme and everything. And it was like, all right, that's it. And uh, it was, it was super last minute too. It was probably, you know, we had to press vinyl and it was, I would say maybe a week or days before we had to like <laughs> submit it to, to be pressed. We decided on, on, uh, on going with that. Um, so it was, uh, right down to the wire, but it worked out. And you've been doing some of the other it's band logos and stuff. You're, you've been dabbling in graphic design is that <laughs> by like necessity. Or... Yeah. I think, you know, when, when the band first started and I think when any band starts, like, you know, you, you scribble on some paper and, and draw something cool. And then, uh, you know, but like the technical side of things, like, how do I get this into a fucking computer? Like, <laughs> I, I drew it. It looks cool. And I have some drawing skills from back in the day, you know, uh, art class and stuff. But, but as far as getting it into a computer and making it look um, cohesive and, and, uh, and, and fit the, the, um, the, the aesthetic of the band, yeah, that's taking time, but I think we're getting better at it. I think it, I think it is a necessity at this point. I mean, any money a band can save, you know, um, not that you should skimp out. Um, you should certainly do whatever you can and, and hire professionals. We've learned that in a few different cases. I mean, even with the recording and stuff, but yeah, the logo, um, I can't, I think it kind of stuck and everyone comments and like, who did your logo? And I was like, yeah, I did. <laughs> so it feels cool. It's like, if it sucked, I would admit it. And I would say, yeah, it sucks. I don't like it. None of us like it. Let's move on. But, uh, but that one, but that one is, uh, is stuck around. So a couple of the things that you guys have talked about, like the, the vision for the band, like it, it seems like you guys have been pretty intentional. Was there like a collaborative process when you got started on either the album or, or just as a band in general that sort of set you forth in a particular direction? Did you guys, what did you guys set out to do i think as far as songs and and direction for sound overall i think i think it's easier to say what we don't like you know um we'll put out ideas and the things that are good make it and and things that aren't good are either changed or scrapped you know there's there's no reason to try and make a not great idea great so I think there's, uh, <clears throat> and that's usually how songs go, where there will be maybe too much, too many riffs, too many ideas, and to take away from art, it's easier to do that than to try and, you know, build off of one little thing. So uh, it it does feel intentional sometimes, but a lot of the times it's, it is just kind of figuring out, sifting through of what you have and, and, you know, picking the best ideas. And I think that's a good problem to have you know, as, as opposed to uh, trying to make an, a, a mediocre idea great, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a, I mean, that's a really cool way to think about it because so often I think uh, with anything, w whatever your, your medium is, you, you get attached to something that you create and you're like, yo, this is dope. And then you get stuck trying to make it work. Um, and then on the yeah. other hand too, it's like editing is really hard. You know what I mean? Like going, ah, fuck this, this is great, but shit it just doesn't work here or or whatever is that right yeah. and i think too it it you know that that kind of uh idea goes with the with the album artwork as well you know uh the the first time we had seen that it was like oh this is great you know all you need to do is kind of push that idea forward as opposed to you know i think we might even ask to to simplify a little bit here and there and that's a good problem to have as opposed to like oh this is awesome can you add more awesome <laughs> you know it was it was already uh, great uh, the first draft we saw so that's cool 
So uh, now that it's out, it's been out for what about a, a month or so? Uh, the album about a week. Been, is it only one been a week? week? Yeah, we've had a bunch yeah. of singles coming out. Uh, but yeah, the album's been out a week. We thought the same thing yesterday. <laughs> I, I thought it'd been a month. It feels like it's all all, all a blur. But um, but yeah, it's been about a week. So it's been great, man. We've been getting really positive responses um in the pr world and and also just from random people like it's so cool to see you know people from brazil argentina australia you know like germany it's just really cool to see you know how fast something can can catch on with the internet it's pretty pretty amazing yeah no doubt i i, I can connect with that with this podcast and just people i'm sure you know, from from anywhere actually i'm wearing a shirt that uh, an awesome dude named Jared from Australia sent me. And I was like, nice. Oh, shit. Like people in Australia are catching the podcast. That's cool. As shit. That's awesome. I mean, it makes sense though, right? That Deftones fans are all over the world, but for a brand new band yeah. to get introduced, well, you guys aren't brand new per se. Like your, your split is the first thing that's on Spotify. Right. And that was what 17 when that's uh, the, the debut LP uh, came first in 2017. Okay. The split was in maybe a year after. Year after, I believe. Um, and those two songs on that split were recorded um, with, with the first record, and we just couldn't fit them on uh, a full length vinyl, so we decided to, to release them separately. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, it does feel like we've been together longer, but in a, in a sense, it doesn't because this record feels like we're coming into our own and and uh, hitting our stride and, and and we've had this same lineup for a couple of years now so we've really been honing our craft with these particular songs and and uh, and again the lineup you know uh, Philippe Armand who who joined playing bass and singing has just added uh, uh, you know whole other layer uh, layers uh, of sound going on so it's it's been great what are your what are your plans next? Are you guys uh, are you guys playing shows uh, on the East Coast? Are you are you going to get out and uh, see the world a little bit, meet some of those Brazilian fans, or what's the <laughs> what what what's the you're looking you're shaking your head like yeah fuck yeah let's go to Brazil yeah I mean that's 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 always been the plan and you know uh, a few months ago it was kind of like well I guess we need to wait and see and it was really hard to jump on the ball and start planning that stuff because it was you know all right who's gonna do what what you know what states can do what and now it seems like things are rolling out uh every day so yeah i mean that's that's been uh what we've been what we've been trying to figure out the last couple of weeks is all right let's start let's start planning some touring let's start where we can play whoever we can play with um you know we have we have a new record to to show people and and i think that's always been the biggest thing is internet is great you know people hearing it is great but i think our live performance is the most important thing you know um so yeah that that's been the idea and then uh do it locally do it regionally and then uh once you know hopefully opportunities happen for us and we can go and play these awesome places yeah no doubt you know i'd love to to be in south america <laughs> yeah shredding for, you know i know Tulum is the thing that keeps coming across my mind. I'm like, God, I just, I need to get to Tulum, man. That's what being in one room for like a year and a half will, will do to you, right? It's like, God, just give me, right. give me to Tulum. Has it been hard? Like, well, how long has the album been done? <laughs> um, we, well, tracking, I mean, even last year, we went back and retracked some things because we had the time. Yeah. Uh, we were going to release it. We just dodged the the bullet, really, because we were about to release it last year around maybe spring or summer and oh, obviously word. everything went down. And so it was, uh, it was a way of, you know, I don't know. It's, it's been done. It's been tracked, but like we went back and, and polished it and uh, did some remixing, you know, ah, this thing needs to sit here better or whatever. Or maybe this vocal part needs an another harmony. Let's add that in. Like Philippe um, came in and, and was playing with us for about a, a year and a half or so. And, and was doing harmonies at practice that weren't on the record. And we were like, well, we got to add this in. Like, it's so cool. Let's go back and, and do it. And we had the, the freedom because we record our own, um, you know, we record drums in a studio. Um, we did the, we did those at uh, Studio G in, in Brooklyn with Jeff Burner. And, um, but everything else we do on our own. So it gives us that freedom to, to tweak things. And 
um, and say, hey, can we do this slightly better? Like, can we go back and try or can we try something different? And then, you know, last year we we remixed and, and mastered it. And then we realized we had to be we had to be done. <laughs> Call it yeah. a day. Right. <laughs> so it's it's never really done until it's released. Right. The vinyl's printed. <laughs> now it's it it just finished last week. <laughs> I mean, it's gotta be both like really relieving, I would imagine, but also like going through that year where you're like, Well, we can go touch it up or we could go touch it again. Like that's I don't know. It seems like they you always hear about bands talking about like the luxury of time and being afforded extra time to work on things and think about it and yeah. maybe go back. And um, but it also seems like kind of a burden at some point when you're just like, fuck, like, let's just get this out. Let's just I'm ready to get it out. It, it's it's a uh, it's a blessing and a curse. I'd yeah. say, you know, I, I think if, if it's one thing it taught me what it was to figure out your ideas and do them really well so that you're not questioning yourself a month after you tracked it or you listen to it you're like oh man i wish i had done this differently or i could have done this better or whatever i think every artist is going to listen to something they put out and feel that way to an extent but if you can uh if you can minimize those feelings and listen to a record and be like yeah i did my best yeah you know? totally well and then there's the the live life of a song I yeah. guess that's something that I've been thinking about, like with artists who have been releasing or working on music over the course of the <laughs> pandemic in particular is because the the song has this entire lifespan that, you know, I, I guess it's akin to any release, but over uh, the, the pandemic, it's got this lifespan where it changes and then evolves. And then when you take it out and perform it, like it's going to change more, right? Like it's going to change again. There's no doubt. Every song does to some degree. Yeah, it's with the live stuff. It's funny because like the first record, we were still experimenting with the sound and the songs. And, you know, there's some brutal YouTube videos of our first performances where there's no lyrics being sang or the tempos are way too fast or whatever. You know, it's so it's, you know, if you go back and, and, and listen to those or watch those, it's, you know, it's not very flattering. But whereas this record, I think because we had so much time, we've actually played some of these songs live before. And and so it does feel more like an old school approach where you tore the shit out of it and then you record it. So it's like, and and then again, you're going to come back around to it and be like, well, we're playing it this way now, but like the record does this and that functions really well. So maybe we need to, you know, add this harmony back in, or maybe this part needs to slow down or speed up. So it's a constant, you know, evolving thing. And, and um, I'm probably the biggest stickler with like, that's how the record goes. We should honor that because it sounds really good on the record. But at the same time, I know that there's, it's going to be different no matter what. And that's part of the beauty of seeing a band live is, you know, how close are they? Are they being authentic to the, to the recorded music or is this a totally different thing? You know, are those like so. legit conversations that you have? Like, yo, we need to fucking stop doing that. Like, like play it like it's on record. Is that like, are those, are those actual I mean, maybe. <laughs> it's, it's hard to say. I mean, like, yes. you can't be too, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you can't be too nitpicky. But if, if the, if the song's not being serviced, I do think it, yeah, I think it matters, you know, especially with the vocals, if you're going to do clean singing and, and, uh, and even the screaming and, and, and all that kind of stuff, tones, you know, guitar tones, so like all that stuff to me, but maybe that's like the engineer side of, you know what I mean? That's I'm the engineer. So maybe I think of things differently like that, but, um, but at the same time, I don't, yeah, I don't think it should be um, a set in stone thing. It should, it should be something that can evolve and change. I, I certainly don't play the same drum fills every single time. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. I think too, uh, as long as you've um, figured out how to play the record and the material and you know it and, and you can improvise after, I think if you're trying to change things before you've mastered what it is you're trying to do, you know, um, I, I think that, that those kind of things naturally happen. If you've been on tour for a month, there's no way you're going to play the songs the, the same way every time, you know, after week three, you're probably going to, do some pinch harmonic where you don't, you know, little <laughs> things that, you know, are fun that kind of, you know, maybe look over and your bass player is laughing at you. I don't know, you know, things to keep it interesting as long as it's not like, 
as long as you're not adding, you know, arpeggios in the middle of a song, sweeping right. through you know, some doom part. <laughs> like, who are you, uh, guy? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, dude, not again. Uh, uh, you know, I think little things are, are fun like that and keep it interesting, but you've got to honor the the core of the song and, you know, not deviate too much from what what makes the song the yeah. song. Yeah. How did you guys come together? How did you guys, uh, you guys, it sounds like you started the band. The two of you are the... We yeah. met on Grinder. <laughs> <laughs> Respect. That's cool. <laughs> um, it's kind of it's kind of uh, I don't want to say cheesy, but we we shared a, a wall in a practice space, and so we've told this a few times now. But we we shared a wall, and uh, we knew each other. We had played in other bands and and uh, played shows together, and. And uh, he's a he's a drummer first, and I knew he was a, a badass drummer, so I never even really considered him as a a person to be in a band with. Although I knew he was a good musician, I was like, well, you know, that guy's a good drummer, but I also play guitar, so there, you know, I'm always thinking about that too. Like I always wanted to start a band playing guitar, and and he beat me to it. He was like, I got to get these <laughs> riffs out, and so we, you know, we we'd hurt, hear each other through the wall, you know put our ear up to the wall kind of thing. And uh, now we, we, you know, I think we just had met in passing and he, he said he wanted to try to join my other project that That's I had right, going because yeah. I was writing guitar and, and, and uh, most of the music for that project. Um, but his song ideas were great. And I was like this, I've been itching to play stuff like this on drums. I, I'd been in a few bands where I was in more of a functional role, you know, just, keep keeping the the beat and not being too flashy or whatever. And, and this band certainly lets me kind of let loose a little bit more. So I was all for it right from the beginning. And he had a bunch of great songs and riffs and uh, we just kept curating and found a bassist in, uh, in Drew Mack um, who, who left the band um, shortly after we recorded uh, Nefarious Wave. And um, yeah, we've been uh, doing it for, I think about five years. But it feels like Ooh. less because we, you know, this downtime last year and uh, and uh, and yeah, it's just like, we again, feel like we're hitting our stride with this album. So no doubt when those when those first uh, conversations started happening, though, happening, though, um, is it more about like, uh, yo, this is what I've been working on. Check this out. Or is it like, yo, this is what I'm envisioning for for this. Um, wh what was the thing that pushed you or propelled you in the the direction that you're going because it's cool to see I, I guess the styles that you're like like it's 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 clear where some of the influences are coming from but the the like the amalgamation of all of them is unique to me you know what I mean like it's definitely mm -hmm. it's not totally familiar but it's familiar so it's like mm -hmm. to me I'm, I'm wondering I guess like at the root of it like how did you guys come together and go like yo this is what we're doing there's very little talk. I think that's, yeah. I think that's how that, um, you know, combination of styles happens is that we don't really talk about it. So there, you know, maybe we'll, we'll say, Hey, this, uh, that riff sounds maybe somewhat like this other band, but we really try not to make those kind of comparisons just, just to not limit the creativity. You know, it's, it's yeah. important to, just just go at it and see what happens. I think that's really important for for musicians and and artists in general is just to like see what comes out of you first and um, and then try to maybe analyze it after. But yeah, when we first started jamming, there was no I don't think we ever had one talk of like, yeah, man, we want to start a sludge, whatever, you know, all the subgenres and these four bands we want to sound like we didn't. And maybe we had had a lot of experience doing that on, on Craigslist or finding, you know, in, in other bands, finding other musicians, you had to put the ad out. You have to, you know, give someone an idea of what it sounds like, yeah. but we just never did that. When we were first starting the band, we, we just got in there, had a bunch of riffs. I had a bunch of grooves. We put them together and then it sort of, sort of you know, took shape and um, in the, in the sub genres kind of aligned or whatever, but there's still no limits. I think, that's the cool thing about this band. It, it always feels fresh because every idea can go anywhere, really. That's rad. Music is the language. Cause that's what that's what I'm always yeah. like uh <clears throat> I guess that's where my mind goes when I when I think about any band and I'm trying to figure out like 
what they were trying to do or their how they're like what the genesis was is i think about like the craigslist post or like you know um band seeks rad drummer or whatever you know what i mean like uh sounds like neil pert and it's like okay yeah. cool you know I mean? like, that's, <laughs> that's gonna be great <laughs> yeah that, that would awesome but uh yeah. but that it's um because i'm not a musician and and so i don't like i'm genuinely curious about how that happens but um it does make sense it like it makes sense that you would just go all right like i'm gonna pick up my instrument you're gonna pick up yours and then we're gonna see what happens and that that sort of sounds yeah. like what happened right like you just you go yeah yeah i think you know there's basic ideas of like oh i was thinking about you know these chords together and maybe a groove will happen and it and it pushes it in a totally different direction and and you know it kind of snowballs you know there's that approach and then there's the approach of like oh i've got these three parts that go together let's just play it and and see how it feels and I think the, the biggest thing of, of not having anything that's um, off off the table, you know, a song like Desire Lines is, you know, not something that, um, you know, when I first started playing, it was like, yeah, what is this? It sounds, you know, it didn't sound like the heaviest thing in the world, you know, and, and I think sometimes if, if I have an idea, I just want to impress my bandmates with it and be like, look, listen to this thing, is it, you know, and... I think uh, a song like Desire Lines is not super impressive when you first hear those first couple notes, you know, but it's, it's about that, the entirety, this, the, the whole song is, is what's cool. The first few notes are not all that cool. So I think it does take time and, you know, to, to trust the guy next to you to believe in their vision and like, all right, I hear you, you know. The, the drum beat for that song is not the flashiest, most powerful thing, but it serves the song. You know, it's, it's the, uh, the, all, all the parts put together. What matters, I guess. You ever like compose something, write something like that you're, uh, I guess, maybe not sure where it's going and maybe you don't like it at first <laughs> or something, but you're like, what? This is oh, yeah. unusual, but <laughs> yeah. like he seems to be like jamming on it. So like, let's just see where it goes. I would say probably 50% of the ideas that I come up with are, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll write something like this rules. And then I'll play it a few more minutes. Like, yeah, this is the worst thing ever, <laughs> you know? And then, you know, uh, I tried to record everything that makes it past, uh, the first time trying it. And, and you know, if I can build on that, but yeah, I think there's always that, that uh, flux of like, God, this is really good. And now oh, this is terrible. And, you know, it, it really has to get to the time where you can show somebody and build from it, from that, the, the first, first moment and never really sure about it until we start playing it together. And then, you know, okay, this, this does work in a context of a song or if this guy likes it, then, you know, we'll, we'll keep building it, I guess. That's cool. <laughs> that's cool. I, I mean, I do. I, I just think that's a really neat way to, I mean, any way that a song comes together is fascinating to me because there's a bajillion ways for a song to come together. So it's like, it's, it's right. To just think about, I'm, I'm very curious about that all the time. I just love. Yeah. I like the origin the story. stairway to heaven. Just was that awesome. Right. From the first time the guy, you know, Jimmy Page started playing it. Like, right. Well, the band spirit wrote it, right? Shit. YouTube's taking this back. Going deep into conspiracies. <laughs> Right. So the first time Jimmy Page heard Spirit playing that song, he's like, this is so great. I've got to write it. I'm going to make it a little bit better, though. <laughs> right. so, um, Let me get some flutes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then every Guitar Center employee was furious for the rest yeah. of their existence. Yeah. Right. Um, so uh, let's talk about Deftones a little bit. At what point... Um, did did you guys ever connect about Deftones like in the just organic playing songs and going like, yo, that kind of sounds like a Deftones riff or like at what point did you guys ever bond over Deftones or how did how did that happen? Or did it happen? Do you guys like just fucking I, I, argue over Deftones instead? Every no, every no. Monday is Deftones day yeah. at practice. <laughs> right. <laughs> I think we I think we found that this was the common influence, um, especially with Philippe who joined the band playing bass now. Um, we, you know, you talk about influences or bands you dig or new records that are coming out and that seemed to be the one that we were all like 
yeah, I'm, I'm a Deftones fan. You're, oh, you're a Deftones fan. So um, I think we probably each have an individual uh, level of how much we like them. You know, I can say I'm a pretty big fan. Um, Likewise. But that said, like, like I've never listened to Gore. It's kind of embarrassing to admit, but I'm, I'm a huge fan. I've never listened to Gore because I, I heard a single and, and, and I also like read an, uh, an interview and saw that they were having like creative differences around writing that record. So for me, it was like, well, they're not even on the same page about it. So is this something that I think is going to be, you know, is this going to be a Deftones record? Is this going to be around the fur or, or uh, white pony or, or whatever? Um, but I got to dive in. I do like the new record a lot. Um, I think we've recently connected on that. We, you know, we, we talked about it. We're like, Hey man, that this new death tone sounds rad. Um, but no, ne never. Um, there's not very many times where a, a song has come up or a riff has come up where I'm like, that's a death tones riff or, or whatever. You know, I don't think we, um, in fact, some, some of the people in our camp, like have, have, oh, you know, like, I won't name names, but man manager or whatever label, it, it kind of like not really seen the comparison because I, I oftentimes I'll say, yeah, we have there's some Deftones um, influence there for sure, especially in, in my drumming. Um, but maybe in the tunings as well, the guitar tunings and the tone. Um, but then, yeah, some people are like, nah, I don't hear it. I don't hear the, that influence. I'm like, all right, fine. That's all good. But um, but as far as like a common influence, that's probably one of the bigger ones. I would say maybe like Queens of Stone Age too. Yeah, um, Deftones. It's, I think it's a hard thing. Well, first thing I I think it's um, divisive against uh, for for metalheads. You know, you you either you either like the Deftones or you don't. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm not sure that I've met anybody that's like, yeah, I kind of like them. You right. know, and <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> yeah, and they've got so much material. And they're all very different, you know. It's I I don't think there's two Deftones records that are alike, and that's that's what I've always enjoyed about them, you know, from from the earliest material to you know what they put out this year. Um, you guys both but, like Ohms a lot. It sounds. I dig it. I got to dive in more, but I I do dig it. Um, it's I don't know. I feel like they're maybe revisiting some, some of that like white pony stuff. I could be, could be wrong there, but, um, but yeah, I mean, and, and as far, I guess it's not that new anymore, but um, diamond eyes, that's like one of my favorites. That record is amazing. Um, How did you guys both get into Deftones? How can you, can you tell me, do you, do either of you remember when or like how you, yeah, the Deftones, you do? Yeah, I do. I, I remember a buddy having around the fur, um, and I had probably heard of them, um, it, but it, to me, you know, and I th think this is probably something they've said in interviews too, but as far as like not wanting to be locked into the new metal, you know, um, stereotypes, totally. um, I think that record felt like something different. It had way more swagger to than, than most of the other stuff in that vein that was coming out. And um, so I remember hearing that you know, shortly after that record was released and, and, and just being blown away by just the sound of it too, you know, like Terry Date's production, the drums, how the drums, like, you know, were cutting through everything. Like, you know, like some people might say, oh man, those drums are too upfront mix wise or whatever, but it just, everything about it slammed and it seemed very deliberate and intentional. Although I think that record, they have said that they um, didn't really have a, uh, you know, set goal in mind. They went into the studio and just started writing. So, um, but everything about that record and, and then, and then I revisited adrenaline and, and uh, that's a great record too, but you can definitely tell that's their first record. And, but around the, uh, around the fur on, I think um, they've always just had that swag, man. They, they have that, uh, the groove that um, it's aggressive, but it still feels like uh, atmospheric, you know? But, yeah, I think uh, the the first I had heard the drum intro for the song "Around the Fur," right? And I think I, I I just like was like, "What is that? Is that is this a song? Is this a is that what a song starts? You can do that, <laughs> you know?" And it was such a, a a cool drum groove, and and I think then I kept hearing uh, "My Own Summer," you know, and and like 
great song but it was like I, I feel like when that song came out it was played everywhere and it was the, the only thing you heard and and then went back through and listened to adrenaline but yeah that that record around the fur is, is still like i feel like it's, it was a classic an instant classic when it came out like hearing that that drum groove and i think my own summer starts out with the drums too like but yep. you know and yeah. uh you know it's it's not like the flashiest drumming band but the, they're just like the perfect the perfect grooves the perfect tones and it, it's yeah I, I think they're a unique band that can have have those kind of uh, uh, uh parts stand out and th those drums are in instantly uh recognizable i love that you yeah. guys are both drummers uh, it's 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 uh, i love that of, it, first of all low-key my favorite part about the band is abe's drumming like there's just that pocket that he sits in he just he's just groovy like it's a constant head knock like you just can't you fall in it like that i think that's amazing yeah. and that, that you both like like that's what you're identifying first off is the drumming and that that rhythm so uh justin were you a drummer first is that what your original instrument was yeah um i started playing guitar a little bit and you know um anybody i grew up in a small town and anybody that i could find who was other musicians were there was just so many guitar players out there so learning drums was kind of a necessity to to play with other people otherwise it'd be like five guitar players in a band and nobody right. else yeah. so yeah and and i think deftones was one of those i remember trying to learn that around the fur groove do, 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 do. yeah you know and when i got it it was the greatest day of my life <laughs> it was like man i can if anything happens to Abe, I could step in, bro. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> and you know that my own letter. summer, uh, my own summer, how it opens that boom pop. He, yeah. he said uh, he stole that from Phil Collins on the uh, Philip Bailey track "Easy Lover," because it's okay. the same way. Boom pop. Yeah, he has oh, a lot of those man. kinds of influences, right? Like he, I think he's like uh, maybe Stuart Copeland, The Police. I yeah, think. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think that's like his bag. I mean, I actually learned how to play guitar from Deftones too. I, I think I was probably mm -hmm. as as much as I loved the drumming, I was I was um, very influenced by the guitar as well. And it was like easy enough riffs to, you know, you could drop tune to drop D, and and I would look up the tabs and try to learn uh, try to learn riffs off around the fur and White Pony, and and that certainly taught me how to how to play guitar because I I sort of learned how to riff and 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 write songs at the same time. And um, yeah, Steph is a huge influence um, sonically as well for me. Um, and in the, the vocals as well, I think just just how ethereal it gets and mm -hmm. and also in aggressive as, as hell sometimes. Um, but yeah, just the whole the whole package. They 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 have everything. Do you guys remember what else you were into when you when you uh, heard around the fur when when you guys started getting into Deftones? What else? What other music you were listening to? I think Deftones was like the gateway for me to get into heavier music. You know, I was like classic rock yeah. was pretty big with me growing up. You know, um, and then definitely some Tool like right around that time. Tool, Nine Inch Nails. Um, you know, I think I think I liked Corn when I was like younger, when they first came out. But I think to me, uh, they do what they do, and the first couple of records are great. I think Deftones for me um, f fit my my style and aesthetic more. Um, and I think Deftones certainly, again, uh, was a gateway to to different stuff that wasn't just in this new metal genre or whatever people were calling it back then, but um yeah um and then i think death sounds also like led me to in, in a weird way to bands like mashuga believe it or not because just you know like the groove is heavy and and oftentimes in four four but maybe the guitar riff is doing something different or the phrasing is different and that make it you know time wise more interesting um but yeah as far as like stuff you were listening to what yeah do you think? i um the same group of friends who showed me deftones they're they're pushing corn on me really hard and it was like yeah I, I get it this is cool but it never grabbed me and it never felt uh i think they have a lot of great material but it never grabbed me as like i want to listen to this all the time 
And yeah, I think uh, I was really into Green Day at the time. I think Nimrod or Insomniac was out and it was, you know, one of those things that was just like, man, really well-written, quick songs, great tones. Uh, um, yeah, Tool was definitely there. I, th I think I maybe at that age couldn't really wrap my head around it uh, of, of what I liked about it, or maybe it was a little too heady, you know, if oh, that's yeah. a thing. <laughs> um <laughs> it's it, it totally yeah and, and a little bit scary to be honest with you like when you were 15 or 18 or whatever and you were watching those videos you were like i don't know if i'm supposed to see this shit like it's these videos <laughs> that's are, how i felt about nine inch nails yeah right? when i was in, when I was in nine inch nails yeah. video yeah I, I i did like uh you know i'm not afraid to admit it i like 311 uh i i was listening to them at the time but it, but you know there was th that kind of rap rock trap thing going on where it's like man there's awesome ideas and cool songs but god you get to this part and the guy's rapping uh <laughs> which i love hip-hop sometimes feels forced but yeah uh, uh yes yeah the, it, it was a really cool time in my life to, to figure these things out and find these new things and for some yeah for some reason deftones when it when it came to me uh, it did feel like, oh, this is different somehow. Like, yeah, I, I can hang my hat on this. This is cool. Even like the raps, there's a couple of things that you guys have brought up that that are thought provoking to me. Um, I'm always curious about like the cross section, like like, like of the fans of, and and what Deftones fans because they do put you onto a lot of shit. I also wouldn't have known about Mashuga were it not for Deftones, and then obviously, f fuck Mashuga. Like, wow. Yeah. But. Um, <laughs> but the different places you 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 come from um i mean shit green day and deftones were were huge in 97 or whatever remember that kerrang yeah. when like uh billy joe is feeding chino grapes like they were both <laughs> giant at that right yeah at that time and and it's like Crazy. Uh, fans were coming from a lot of different places and and i was a i'm definitely a hip-hop fan i'm i'm an unbridled like chino rap fan like i feel like it's a, a he does it well it's a disservice that he doesn't do it anymore you know what i mean like fuck <laughs> that dude and his raps weren't never like, say never they, they weren't like anybody else's it wasn't like insane in the brain like it wasn't no disrespect nah, he had his own video. cadence totally different right like there was yeah. some other musicality that was going on and so all of those things are are really um really interesting and then the thing uh like that about them taking you to other uh, music introducing you to other music that's a huge whether it was their covers or just hearing about the bands that they were into um, so my question is what is the uh, coolest band or wildest band or whatever that Deftones put you on to hmm. man um, I can't think of a, a band that the Deftones have put me on to I think because they're in their own category for me you know and kind of like what you were saying earlier is like they're always being revisited you know there's there's always a time uh, and mine was, I guess when Ohms came out, uh, I listened to it. I was not blown away and then went back the next week and was like, okay, I think I get it. Wow. So, you know, it, and they always, I think their records always kind of do that for me of like, um, maybe I'm not blown away immediately and come back in a week. And then I'm like, oh no, this is, I think Diamond Eyes did that initially where it was like, no, this is awesome. You know, and they were gone for a few years at that point. But, uh, I, yeah, I can't think of a band that the Deftones have turned me on to um, uniquely. You know, uh, to me, they're they're their own thing. That's cool. I, I would say in a backward sense, maybe a band like Sepultura. Like yeah. I didn't grow up with that stuff, but I think hearing their that influence in Deftones or hearing them talk about Sepultura yeah. or Meshuggah. Um, yeah, the song they did with uh, Max Cavalera and, yeah. and Soulfly. And, yeah, right. it was the first like, time Soulfly was said on a track. Like that's where the name of Soulfly <laughs> comes from. Is from Head Up, is the right. And it that's on right. that song, which is an amazing, it's like the origin of that song being uh, about his uh, his kid who passed away, and it's like, right, yeah, like, brutal. And then it's the song that they like close every show with for like I don't know the the next five years. It was right, just a nuts thing. But that's cool. So that that Deftones put you on to say who because Sepultura was pretty massive was roots out i can't the, the, I decide, the, 
discography and yeah the timeline of like what when they put stuff out I, i'm not sure of but just in general age. like just having to go back and listen to that and um unfortunately probably at the time downloaded on napster or whatever but yeah um but still i discovered a band that I, I never knew about and probably wouldn't have known about my friends were certainly not into heavy music you know i think we're both from small towns and um so you know you you're kind of influenced by what you hear on the radio and and it's up to those bands being cool enough to to put you know other bands on or, or recommend other bands um same thing with tool i knew about tool and and uh and they talked about mashuga they talked about other bands or they collaborated with each other on uh, on tracks so i think there is um yeah i think I, I, but i do think the deftones stand on their own and it, it's uh Again, I think they broke out of that that uh, the tropes of new metal pretty quickly, to be honest. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't uh, it wasn't too hard for them to do it, but it sort no. of seemed like they got a lot of flack for it. And I mean, because like remember how massive Limp Bizkit was, and like new metal, just, yeah. it was such a. I mean, it was bands were getting thrown money at them. Like they were just hard see. enough to know it wasn't going to last. I think, right? I mean. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong there, but I think they, I think they just knew it wasn't, you know, they, they didn't want to be defined by something and they were um, authentic to themselves enough to say, let's not get caught in this, you know, let's do, let's keep, keep it moving. So could you, could you imagine like the, let, let's just for the sake of argument, like say that you got lumped into a sound, right. And that sound became hugely popular and you guys go like, all right, well, we're going to go left. How hard is that, do you think? Uh, yeah, I, I think for me, my natural tendency is to zig when I'm supposed to zag, you know? <laughs> so I, I could certainly see that of like, man, people are loving this particular style. I want to go the other way. But I, I think for us in our band, we do a lot of different things. So I, I don't see us riding one particular thing that could, you know, I don't see that scenario playing out because I don't you know, either. I think I, every I song is kind of different. Uh, <laughs> Pretty you know. tough scenario to change. That, was, that question is an interesting question though. That's, that's, that question is pretty much probably, you know, why we would sound the way we do, I think, because yeah, we don't, we don't want to um, be akin to just one genre or one style or one scene. And, um, wouldn't say it's a fear of you know fitting in too much but it's if you're not make if you're not trying to push boundaries then what, what are you doing you know you're just uh recreating a sound that's already happening um so and there's there's some of that in in the sludge and doom scene and, and stoner rock stoner metal you know you we've all heard the tropes and i think um for us it's about it's about getting outside of that and and putting ourselves in a in a uh, different comfort zone. I mean, you know, like, like we were talking about earlier when a song comes up and we, we decide if we like it or not, you know, there's times where, I, you know, I, I might not like a, a song at all. And then and I'm like, well, hold on, this is tapping into something different. Let's, let's explore it. Let's let it happen. So that's cool. That's, that's, uh, that's something that's at the heart of my curiosity is like how aware you are of what you're doing when you're doing it. You know what I mean? Cause there's, mm -hmm. It's definitely something to be said for, all right, we're creating, we're jamming, we're letting things happen. Um, this musical idea turns into this musical idea, but like also that awareness of just going like, oh, yo, like that's new and different or, or cool. Yeah. And like, like, what? yeah, I think uh, a song in a various way, the title track um, at first kind of was maybe too stoner dooms, you know, whatever I feel like, that subgenre has been, I don't know, for the last 10 years or something, there's been a lot of great bands that do it. And, you know, I think it's one of those things of like, uh, I don't know if, if you're going to get bored of an idea quickly, then just don't do that. You know, cause there's no way you can, you can play that song and it's fun and interesting for years. But uh, for some reason, a song like that was able to make the cut for us. Um, there's interesting parts to it. it. It keeps it moving enough, but I think there are um, ideas like that where it's like, is this to this or to that? And I don't know, we're not going to put out a, a country record anytime soon. I don't think, <laughs> but I, I think it's like that 
yeah, I don't know if there's if there's an idea out there, let's let's pursue it. And if if it piques our interest, you know, follow it. And that's how you start rapping. Yeah, I was thinking of that. <laughs> if, if, if we're like we're in the studio, and like hold on, I got uh, I need I more. I want to spit a bar. <laughs> I need more snare in my headphones. Fuck it, why not? Right. And it's funny though that last song is very like um it, it reminds me of like a lot of the the last tracks on deftones records like the pink maggots and those songs that are slower burns and they sort of nod to what directions like they ended up exploring further you know what i mean do you think that's the case with you guys like you're gonna maybe dive into that uh style further or explore and experiment in that way i think it's inevitable i think I think the um, the big thing is always is the song. I mean, it, like even when that song was being written, the groove itself on drums and even guitar and bass is is pretty is pretty straightforward. One would maybe call it boring, um, but as soon as everything else comes in, the 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 vocals are huge in that song, right? And uh, and even tonally, I think once the guitars are laid down, so we have a few different phases of writing. Like we'll just try to jam things first, and then um then we'll try to nitpick it more demo it out and uh for me doing the engineering stuff like i always need to hear guitar stereo bass in the middle drums sounding big before i can really sink my teeth into something like it, i can't tell from a phone recording if it's cool or not I, i'm an audiophile i need to hear um you know everything in full and that song is a perfect example of like Jamming that at first, I was like, this is going to suck. Is this and too now, slow? And, and now, now it's one of my favorite songs on the record because once you listen to it in, in, in its entirety and you hear it um, through some speakers, all that kind of good stuff, it's a, it's a different animal. So Yeah, and a, and a song like that, too, that does come across basic or not flashy is dependent. Like, all right, well, let's pull off and see what what the vocals are going to do. You know, is it? It's going to be inter interesting enough to carry for seven minutes, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, I, th I think, you know, uh, it's, it's good to know that we can do that and maybe, you know, not more, not nefarious way part two, but we can do things like that and trust the process. And I think the other side of the page too, of like, you know, what's, what's the limits of, you know blast be, how how fast can we go can we do a, a truly like grindy or thrashy thing like again nothing's off the table and that's sort of what a track like that does too is it's it sort of lets people know like yo we're not gonna do one thing which is cool like i think that's a right an important statement to make on any for any artist is like Unless you are, I don't know, Limp Bizkit and you're going to, yeah, that's it. That's what we got. So, uh, although I would consider $3 Bill Y'all is a fucking sick album. I, I'm not going to. I rock the shit out of that record. I'm not going to back down. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I, remember, I remember hearing that uh, this uh, so, uh, older girl who was super hot uh, <laughs> was playing it. I was like, you're hot and this is great. But I remember hearing it and just hearing um, the guitars and thinking like, man, this this is kind of weird and unconventional yeah. you know even for for that style of music there's weird chords going on there's you know i, I really I've, I've always loved uh west borland's playing and his approach you know it um it's too bad he was saddled with <laughs> yeah uh, you know he made him a lot I of think, money um, but he also put him in he, i mean they're a nostalgia act now you know what i mean a nostalgia act right. that can headline a, a festival i guess but nonetheless sure still a, yeah you know, nobody wants the next limp biscuit album right now i think he's even gone so far as to say that like nobody wants the right, next right. limp biscuit album. they want to hear nookie again. right yeah yeah, yeah there's some i was reading where he's like uh yeah we have a record it's almost done but does anybody really want this thing <laughs> <laughs> yeah at least at least they're honest about it I guess. yeah it's yeah, like yeah, the yeah. olive garden of rock and roll yeah <laughs> <laughs> all the breadsticks hey, can... is pretty good man <laughs> unlimited slaps. breadsticks dude <laughs> the never-ending salad bowl i mean come on oh. um did you guys ever see uh deftones uh live have, have you caught them in at a show yeah uh i think we we uh on we didn't know this but i think we we're at the same show 
back uh, back in like must have been i think it was 2003 it was it was white pony tour and um so we got talking one day and we're like have you seen deftones I'm like yeah I've, I've seen a bunch i was like one of my favorite times i ever saw them was at this uh amphitheater in saratoga and it was like lightning and rain and and, and he was like wait a minute i was there because we're both from upstate new york so i was like Wow. Okay. So we were, uh, we were both there and I think they, I think Godsmack yep. headlined and, uh, yeah, I can't remember the openers, but yeah, that was, um, that was amazing. And then I saw Deftones a bunch on, um, the self-titled tour. Um, and that was like, I love that record. I don't know if that's, you know, how that's revered as, as far as the fans go, but, um, I love that record. So yeah, the self-titled, that's my heart. I love that one. And I've, yeah. I've been exploring some of those. You know, you can find a lot of that shit on YouTube. So yeah. the live performances are a lot of what maybe people perceived at the time as not interesting or maybe a miss. Right. Now sounds to me really interesting because they, like everything's slower, a little bit more mm -hmm. no doubt maybe. And, yeah. and there are a lot of things happening like in between the notes that are interesting. Yeah me like the, they were playing a lot of with reverb and like letting shit it's those those sounds and and the songs too the songs mm -hmm. that they basically scrapped from from any of their live sets anymore uh, those those songs back then from that self-titled in particular um there's some amazing shows online uh on youtube from from the yeah. self-titled era yeah i love i love love yeah that. I think um i had seen them on that cycle and i really loved the record when it came out I think what Minerva was the lead single or something and the video was cool. And then I'd seen them on that tour and it was bad. You know, it was, it was like, they were, I, I don't know. It was everything. It was like the performance. They didn't seem into it. The sound yeah. was bad. Yeah. It was the shitty place. Yeah. Uh, it was just, yeah. And so, but I'd had a redeemer after that when I had seen, it was like, Oh, this is fucking amazing. You know? And it really was one of those things uh, that was, um, humanizing i guess it was like man a band so great and i mean they've got iconic legendary status at this point i mean how many records do they have nine. seven or something nine, nine? nine yeah and you know at, at that time when i'd seen them it was 2004 or five you know they've been doing it a long time at that point and could still have shitty shows make great material have great shows you know what i mean it was it was really i guess kind of inspiring to like you know hey shrug it off keep going you, you know you make great stuff sometimes you uh you have a bad show keep going That's i've always cool. heard this uh the legend of the bad deftone show and i don't believe it every time i've seen them <laughs> they were great Phenomenal. i feel like i feel like no i feel like there there is it's set and setting i think the vibe is a huge thing i think that is i think being humanized is a is certainly um a thing because you know, like when you're playing an arena, you know, monitoring and how you hear yourself and all that kind of shit matters. And I don't think as a kid, I even thought of that at all. I think it was humanizing to see a band. I'm like, can he hear himself or or or, or maybe the sound was just off or whatever. But for me, they always brought the fucking energy, man. They always had there was never I never <clears throat> saw them where I didn't think they were into it or whatever. But um, and also just like as they've you know progressed each record i think different soundscaping you know once frank was a full member i think that certainly adds a lot and i need to see them again i haven't seen them in a long time i would love to see them soon you and me both man you and me both. <laughs> and that godsmack show the openers were uh puddle of mud and cky cky was uh, an opener. no way I, I don't think so. i I think I've seen CKY, CKY, but not at that show. I think it was a different band. Yeah, I can't remember the name. I think it was like Chevelle or something. Uh, For sure in Chevelle Minneapolis, it was CKY. and I love CKY. Uh, That's Puddle a great band, too. Yeah, I would have remembered seeing Puddle of Mud. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I do she remember the first me. time I saw Puddle of Mud. And and uh, it was right before that shit came out or like uh, maybe as it came out. And it was very clear, like, yo, this band's going to blow up. They were still, like, tiny. But whatever the first song was that they really popped off with, like, it was very clear. Like, people were, like, turning their heads and, like, oh, shit, yeah. this is, this is going to be huge. And now yeah. they are what they are. You know what I mean? The life of a band is... It's unbelievable to, to see, 
the progression, you know, and, and like you said earlier, where, where it's like, do you stay in this thing and keep doing it and, and just keep plowing away? Or do you evolve and try to do something, something different? Yeah. Um, that is interesting. I think in a way with Deftones, at least, um, the fact that they never had a super massive song has allowed for some of that for them to sure. not. Cause once you put out Nookie, you, you're the Nookie band, right? Or whatever. That is, that's a good point. Yeah. And it's probably yeah. cause how do you recreate change? You know what I mean? Like how, do, right. how do you do change in the house of flies part two? Like that just doesn't seem mm-hmm. that, that white pony part two was an expectation that people had when they dropped mm-hmm. the self titled, like, how would they pull that off again? That just doesn't right. seem feasible right. for some reason. I don't know. Um, That's probably the biggest song, right? Change. For sure. Far and away. Yeah. 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 Not even bigger close. than Be Quiet and Drive. Massive. Yeah. Be Quiet and Drive, I think, was uh, a, a big song, but My Own Summer still eclipsed that as far as like right. maybe radio success or whatever. Um, and, the, right. and, you know, after, after White Pony, then people stop buying albums anymore right like that was right yeah right around that time that was sort of the end of it so it's very and that's another part of their story that is very fascinating to me too because there just aren't any bands from that era who still like really go corn does it but and they're huge arguably Mm -hmm. bigger than deftones in in ways but Mm -hmm. that they have sustained this lifespan with these artful albums that yeah you know, our heavy, heavy music, but it's artfully done. You got to listen to Gore, dude, yep. by the way. Gore fucking is cool. It's cool. Shit. I'm going to do it. I've been putting it off for years and I'm like, all right, it's it's time to to revisit it. You had a whole global pandemic to do it. Yeah. And, uh... <laughs> it's like, what were you working on an album or something? It's not like you had anything going on. Oh, yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> no, but it's it's dope. You acknowledge that they're separation or their distance was like had an impact on your listening i think i feel that way about saturday night wrist still like i don't i don't mm-hmm. fuck with that album or I, I definitely didn't fuck with that album as heavy when it came out because i knew how split the band was but now it's like this whole resurgence and people love saturday night wrist it's kind of crazy i think that's what made me want to listen to that yeah it's like oh yeah i hear this might be the last one it barely came out how bad is it and hole in the earth was a single and i was like oh this sucks but then once once i got it within the context of the whole record i liked the song more i think the whole record's awesome there's some good tracks there, there's definitely i think i was hooked at that point so i was sort of loyal and i i just went into it thinking all right this is deftones like it, I, I gotta give this a chance and i, I, re- I actually really like that record um even the then, Serge well, Tankian part the, with me and even that part. <laughs> nobody likes that shit, man. It surged from uh, the down. It should be amazing. And he's giving us the you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the, the song itself is is not super great, you know, and I, I don't think it helped to it's a dance just, you know, kind of throw like him on there. Yeah. Right. And then yeah. he's it does seem like he's sort of thrown on there, right? Like it's sort of yeah. tacked on at the end. Tiny yeah. bit, yeah. If there is a weak weak link of that record, I'd say that's it. But uh, I don't know what's there eleven, twelve songs on that record, and so that's I think that's a pretty good success rate. If you got one that's <laughs> kind of a you know it's short enough to live live with it as it goes by. You know, there's there's I'm sure some redeemable things about it. Yeah, I, I, I'm I'm not uh, gonna disagree. Drumming with school. There. Yeah, he's yeah. doing some bell accents. That's cool. <laughs> uh, that's about, that's about it. <laughs> All right, so um, a, a couple of quick hitters. Um, mm-hmm. Favorite Deftones album, and then uh, favorite song or songs, if you got a couple that you want to hit. Jesus, oh, man. <laughs> it's got to be, for me, it's got to be Around the Fur, just because that was the first exposure to it. And I also just think experimentally that record is 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 amazing. But... But then again, White Pony is uh, probably more my formative years, I guess. So, um, and I and I actually really like the opening track on that record, uh, Fetch a Sarah, I think yeah. is how you pronounce it. That song, like trying to learn that on guitar and just the whole cadence of it was was amazing to me. Um, but I'm gonna stick with Around the Fur. Uh, I really like. 
the B sides rarities record. Weird. I think the ordinary love cover. Oh, that's sick. Uh, <laughs> <what? Can't, laughs> the cover album's your favorite <laughs> album. That's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> that's cool as shit. And you know that's uh, Jonah Matrena no, on most of that song too. That's Jonah from Far singing most of that shit. Okay. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, He's on there. No, I, 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 had, I think stumbled upon that. Uh, it may, maybe it, it had been out for a while, and then found it. I was like, oh, this is. Um, I really like that. I really like Saw Day to begin with, but that cover is great, and it's. I don't know. It's such a Deftones thing to go you know zig when you're supposed to zag and do this thing that maybe you're not supposed to do and and uh cover some neo soul um yeah but no th- I, I just i i really appreciated that record and, and those covers but yeah i think around the fur just for that i mean there's not a bad song on it you can listen to that whole thing and uh and i think there's a even the secret track yeah i I love that one too i don't know if there's a name to it uh yeah it's demon oh yeah uh but yeah i think they're like taking a bong hit like (laughs) minute 46 (laughs) like a minute before the song kicks in or something (laughs) uh nostalgia value and and it's just uh it's a banger the whole way through i think you know, I, I could go the rest of my life without hearing my own summer again, just because at that time it was just drilled into your head. It was on MTV. It was on the radio. But yeah, I, th- I think uh, around the furs, probably the one. It's such a fun <laughs> question to ask because it's so brutal to answer it. It's hard. Oh, right. God, what my, my problem. Every is, answer is wrong. Yeah, every answer is wrong. <laughs> exactly. It's like, fuck <laughs> What's me, yours? What about that one. I've been rolling with ohms, honestly. I think since it's come out, it's um, it's become on the first listen. I like you, like was not totally there on it, and then after uh, the second and third and fourth, and I mean the first track, the opening track, it did have me. I was very mm-hmm. deep into this podcast and like trying yep. to navigate my way through the pandemic. But like ohms, ohms has come through. I think it's the most interesting. I think um, all really? five guys are like fully at the front. Awesome. Um, and, and for those reasons, uh, I, I'm, I'm most intrigued by it. Um, White Pony is arguably like the, the best, you know what I mean? If you want to talk about their, their career and all of that. Uh, but mm-hmm. if I was going to go with like, a, I don't know, my, my favorite in my heart is probably the self-titled. I, I love that self-titled, man. That, that shit's cool. Got Bloody Cape, yeah. Eagles and Pins, Battle Oh, Act. man. There's Bloody just Cape, songs badass that, song. And it's, it's just this the whole time. Yeah. Just, and I, that's me all day. The only song on that record, though, that confuses me is Lucky You, the one that's like the, I don't even know how yeah. you, what, what, what kind of music is that? Is that like trip hop? I don't know what that yeah, is. Yeah, they always have that kind of one track on there. That's, yeah, is that, that it or is it a Pink Cell Phone? No, that's that's on, uh, that's on Saturday Night Wrist. That's yeah, the, that's the greasy, oh, filthy yeah. hand jobs in <laughs> of, in whatever restaurant that's why british people have bad teeth or whatever right oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah let's like put this on the record. Too. that song's dope that song's that song's got a nice like it's like, <laughs> doom, sh, doom, doom. I'm like okay yeah whatever yeah that shit's cool as hell um the way i like to uh conclude every uh podcast is with a request for recommendations this is something that's inspired by uh a thing that chino said on a on a pod where he was like the only the only reason I tweet out uh, or the only thing that I tweet out is links to YouTube uh, songs that I like. Cause he's, he thinks that's the coolest shit that people can get from him mm-hmm. a song recommendation. Here's some, here's some cool shit that I like. So with that spirit in mind, um, can you give me three recommendations? Um, not each, I'm not going to make you rack your brain, bet- but just between the two of you, you might have to fight on, on the third recommendation, but uh, of literally anything, it can be music. It can be, um, you know, a great place to vacation. It can be a book that you read or a, a show that you watch, um, old or new, three things that you think people should check out. Uh, I'd say the first thing would be Sam Nuri's new record, Nefarious Wave. <laughs> yeah. uh, <laughs> I am not uh, Any sort of, yeah, pl- plug that shit. Get that shit out. All right, that's one. Yeah, you got that, <laughs> got that out of the way. Um, I really like the new Genghis Tron record. You, you're into them? Dude, that record is cool as hell, right? Yeah, I was I didn't know really about cool. their their older stuff. I wasn't familiar with them until this, but wow, that is like yeah. a, 
a really cool and <laughs> deftones fans i feel like should like that album oh yeah yeah there's this other band that chino turned me on to loathe uh recently he, ma he made some kind of comment like oh man these are just like better deftone songs or something i don't know it was something along those lines i might be misquoting but i really like that band too um man we gotta give something other than music oh boy um let me look at my bookshelf <laughs> sleeping everybody should check out sleeping for a little bit uh <laughs> seven to eight hours <laughs> my thanks to justin and phil from somnuri they're playing desert fest in queens this weekend make sure you check them out if you're in new york city and give nefarious wave a spin too badass album uh, next week my guest is an up-and-coming multi-instrumentalist producer engineer and all-around badass who also happens to play bass in legendary power violence band despise you i'm talking to andrew solis next week don't miss it my name is woody you can reach me on twitter and instagram at woodbra if you want to talk about deftones hit me up thank you for listening to deftones and thanks for listening to change in the house of pods <laughs>